from CBS News Bay Area. This is the Evening Edition. So I'm Brian Hackney. And I'm Andrea Nakano. We start with a gruesome story out of the North Bay. Police have arrested a man accused of decapitating a relative in Santa Rosa. The suspect is 24-year-old Luis Gustavo Arroyo Lopez. He was taken into custody today in San Francisco. Santa Rosa police have been searching for him since Thursday after officers responded to calls of a possible homicide on Pomo Trail. Police say they made a disturbing discovery there. They found a woman beheaded inside of her own home. Investigators believe the suspect may have ran off with the victim's head. Neighbors are in shock, saying this is a normally very quiet neighborhood. One resident we spoke to yesterday said they may have witnessed the final encounter between the victim and her killer. I paused over here with my dog because I didn't know who this guy was. And just to make sure that my neighbor knew who he was, they were just, you know, talking back and then the door closed. And I thought, oh, she knows the guy. Police say Arroyo Lopez was recently released from state prison for assault with a deadly weapon and weapon possession charges unrelated to this incident. Investigators have not disclosed whether or not the head has been recovered. People living in a neighborhood just north of Uptown Oakland say they are fed up with increased crime associated with a nearby encampment. About 20 people live in RVs, cars and tents under the freeway on 29th Street. Neighbors say they notice more stolen vehicles abandoned in the area. Don Lynn has the story. Neighbors say the problem started around August. They saw more stolen cars left on 29th Street. They want the city to crack down on it before it gets even worse. A neighbor documents the stripped cars left on his street. He tells me it's turning to a chop shop for car thieves trying to make a quick buck. Other neighbors say they too are frustrated. I have seen an increase in stolen vehicles, um, actually both on this block and on 30th. Um, you know, they show up, they've got no plates, um, they're kind of messed up, and over the next couple days you see everything gets stripped off and then they're gone. Neighbors say while the thieves may not live at the encampment, they may be associated with the people who live there. As a mother of three, my anxiety is very high every time my child leaves this home. Every time she leaves the school and she's coming back, I am scared for her to make sure that she makes it from school into this house. Nikki wants to remain anonymous because she and her family live less than a block away. Yeah, there needs to be a change. It really does. For me, it's just about safety. Her husband's car remains in the parking lot because they can't afford to fix it. Just got it fixed. And then the next day, they stole the Cadillac converter right up off of it. And we found someone sleeping it in. Yeah, the alarm went off early, early in the morning, and my husband came down and found out someone was sleeping in his car. Fred Strayhorn has lived at the encampment for a year and a half. He says about 20 people live under the bridge. He says the people who dump the cars are outsiders. We're over here trying not to not to get in, cause no trouble and do just live and let live things continue the city has no choice but to shut this camp down you know what i mean because it's becoming a nuisance to the neighborhood councilwoman carol fife represents the area she's working with city departments on an enforcement plan she released a statement saying due to the sensitive nature of the operations we aren't able to share details but we're working to address the safety needs of the housed and unhoused individuals living in and near dangerous conditions as for Nikki, she says change can't come soon enough. If there was a way that they could, you know, be transferred somewhere else, I think that that would be great. Many neighbors tell me they're sympathetic because these folks have nowhere to go, but they also worry about the illegal elements the encampment attracts. And now to the ongoing war in the Middle East, where the Israeli military is both fighting on the ground in Gaza and continuing to drop bombs on the small territory. Palestinians in Gaza are in constant fear for their lives. Early this morning, a deadly strike hit a convoy of ambulances outside a hospital. Israel took credit for that, saying the ambulances had Hamas fighters, but Palestinian authorities say they were carrying wounded. Amid mounted pressure to call for a ceasefire, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is meeting with diplomats of neighboring Egypt and Jordan, but he says a ceasefire would not be in the interests of U.S. or Israel. It's our view that uh, a ceasefire now would simply leave 
Hamas in place, able to regroup and repeat what it did on October 7th. We don't accept it is self-defense. It is a raging war that is killing civilians, destroying their homes, their hospitals, their schools, their mosques and their churches. It cannot be justified under any pretext, and it will not bring Israel security. It will not bring the region peace. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the bombing of Gaza won't stop until the hostages are freed, but other Middle East nations are trying to negotiate an exchange, trading the Israeli hostages for Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jail. Several pro-Palestinian rallies happening across the world this Saturday. Tens of thousands of demonstrators in Washington, London and Paris took over the streets, calling for an end to Israeli bombardments killing civilians. Rallies also happening here in the Bay Area. This is what it looked like at San Francisco City Hall. John Ramos says they want the killing of women and children to stop. It's been four weeks since the attacks by Hamas started all this, and the demonstrations against Israel have only gotten larger. The question now is whether it will have an impact on U.S. lawmakers and United States policy. Another week, another mass demonstration in San Francisco over the conflict in Israel. After the barbarous attacks by Hamas, Israel's relentless response has caused the size of the protest to grow steadily. We're taking to the streets. We're making our voices be heard because we're not going to be complicit in a massacre. This pro-Palestinian rally in front of San Francisco City Hall drew thousands of people, many like Sand and John Symes of Marin County. They have no stake in the land dispute between Israel and the Palestinians, but the horrific images on the evening news are something they say they cannot ignore. Well, I think it's convincing people to get to come out of their homes and come on the street like we have, for sure. But I don't think people are listening right now. I think there's so much anger, there's so much resentment, there's so much history in this place that it feels like we keep missing the point. We keep missing sitting down and really listening to each other. I can feel the momentum of it. Uh... And that's why we had to get out today. My son's in Trafalgar Square right now, or he was earlier today. Same deal. People who just feel the injustice of the, of the world. A rally organizer named Noor says people who never would have gotten involved in such a matter are now being influenced through the power of social media. Before, it was a lot harder for people to just take out their phones and, you know, see what Israel is doing on the ground. But now it's like you have videos, you have photos showing what's happening. It's hard for people to deny it when they see it right in front of their face. But will it ultimately have any impact on America's support of Israel in the conflict? UC Berkeley political science professor Ron Hasner has his doubts. So the American government has made its stance very clear. You will have seen the incredible bipartisan vote earlier in the week in which 98% of the House of Representatives backed a very strong anti-Hamas pro-Israel statement. The American public, I think, uh, responds viscerally to images of Palestinian fatalities, and there have been high rates of Palestinian fatalities, many killed by Hamas, many killed by Israel. The government was largely in support of the Vietnam War until images brought home convinced the public of its futility, turning the tide of the war. These days, communication is much faster, so Americans are faced with the reality of what Israel's war on terror actually looks like. Back at the rally, Sand said she hopes public opinion can have some influence on the conflict. I've got to believe that it can, or else otherwise I'm left with hopelessness, so I've got to keep hope. So it's a way that I keep hope alive. It's hard enough keeping people alive. Saving hope may be even harder. Palestinian children in the Israeli-occupied West Bank showed their support for the children of Gaza. They waved flags and posters with messages asking people to boycott Israeli products. Meanwhile, in Tel Aviv, thousands of Israelis gathered demanding action to release hostages taken by Hamas. Some demonstrators waved Israeli flags, while others held photos of loved ones they say were taken captive. Back in the Bay Area, CHP is investigating a hit and run at Stanford as a possible anti-Arab hate crime. It happened in the early afternoon yesterday on Campus Drive near Bodine Street. The Muslim Arab student told police the driver made eye contact and accelerated before striking them and shouted an expletive at 
quote, you and your people. The victim is receiving medical care and will be okay. The suspect is described as a white man in his 20s driving a black Toyota 4Runner. Stanford officials condemned the incident and said they were profoundly disturbed. Uh, Latin American activists gathered outside Nancy Pelosi's San Francisco home today. They say that she failed to address human rights issues at the border. This also comes after last month's the, the Biden administration overrode dozens of laws to allow border wall construction in South Texas, a tactic that Trump's administration used to secure the border. Feds say that there have been almost 250,000 illegal entries in South Texas this year alone, but the demonstrators say there's not a good uh, enough way to le enter legally. East Bay drivers are dealing with a major highway closure this weekend. Southbound 680 is shut down between the 580 connector in Pleasanton and Highway 84 in Sunol, while crews repave the roadway. The closure began yesterday at 9 o'clock at night, and it won't reopen until Monday morning at 4, so plan accordingly. Listen, do you want to know a secret? Actually, it's no secret by now. Paul and Ringo have released what's supposed to be the last Beatles song. The song was actually a John Lennon demo from nearly 50 years ago, but it was revived with a little help from artificial intelligence. I know it's true. It's all because of you. AI, really just a new word for software, made it possible to enhance the vocal and add instrumentation from the other Beatles, yes, even George Harrison, who recorded a guitar solo for it back in 1995. For his part, John Lennon recorded, first recorded Now and Then, it's the name of the song, in the late 70s. Quality was too poor, and frankly, at the time, there wasn't that much interest in the song. But here we are, 50 years later almost, and audio software has extracted the original vocals that John did, blended them with Paul and uh, Ringo going into the studio uh, with musical additions from George. Of course, Paul and Ringo didn't have any trouble with music rights. Uh, an attorney who focuses on in intellectual property litigation nevertheless has this. Generally, it is not okay to take somebody else's work without permission, but the law does provide a lot of, ex of room for fair use uh, to allow and, and foster creativity. And that's, that's the line that we're trying to draw in the artificial intelligence space. Tells us the number of, and I'm sure that Paul and Ringo were all for it. He tells us the number of disputes about artificial intelligence in the music industry in the last few months has really skyrocketed. But again, it's just audio software. Uh, Darren, what do you think? You're the Beatles guy. Yeah. What did you think? I, I can't get it out of my head. I oh, love yeah. it. I love oh, it. Oh, so okay. So it's like, just, you got to really be a Beatles fan though to love it. Otherwise, it's just like a song, and like, what's the big deal? But if you love them, it's uh, I've listened to it like twenty times. It's, it's the Beatles, God. man. That's it for us at five. We'll see you back here at six. The CBS Weekend News is next.